the world is changing very quickly. So what are the biggest geopolitical forces driving the markets today? Joining me now is Matt Gertkin, Vice President of Geopolitical Strategy at BCA Research, and I'm David Lynn of Kiko News. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, David. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, we have a lot of news coming out of North Korea as we speak. Last week, the Chinese delegation sent a medical team to investigate the health of their leader, Kim Jong-un, who was rumored to be dead, but now is confirmed by South Korea to still be alive. Can you explain the significance of this meeting and what this means for markets? We don't really know anything about what's happening in North Korea yet. I think the South Korean denial that anything unusual has occurred is important. The U.S. president, as well as a Pentagon official, have said much the same. Uh, so the rumors should be kept at arm's length for now. But it is interesting that the Chinese sent a delegation. That suggests that something is going on. Uh, nobody knows quite what. Kim is supposed to have had heart surgery. Uh, look, if he dies, if he's incapacitated, that is a threat to global stability. And so that will inject a risk premium in assets in the region particularly Korean assets, but if it then spreads to a bigger issue, which I think it would, you would have a really emerging market assets in Asia start to, to feel a little bit of weight on them. Can you explain a little more why this would add a risk premium? Um, do they not have succession planning? And is there a risk that escalation would uh, happen with the West? Yeah, normally I would say, don't worry about it. North Korea is a red herring. It won't really affect the financial markets. The difference is that today we're in an environment in which the United States and China do not have stable relations. And so in that context, if you then lose the North Korean leader, uh, you have a power vacuum because you're correct. There is no succession plan and a power vacuum in that location at this time, you know, global pandemic, recession, U.S. election. The, this is a very volatile, toxic mix of, of events. And so I would want to at least be leery of of South Korean assets at a time like that. The instability that would occur in North Korea may not be immediate. Uh, no one really knows what the timing would be, uh, but there would eventually be instability if he dies. Do you see the potential for conflict rising in, let's say, the Middle East or potentially with North Korea now? That's exactly the point here, is that the United States is uh, is reluctant to intervene globally for obvious reasons in the Middle East where in South Asia we had negative experiences with the recent wars. Both President Obama and President Trump, totally different political parties in a polarized era, wanted to remove U.S. commitments to wars abroad, and the, and the U.S. public broadly supports that. So that means the U.S. is backing off some and the rest of the world is then able to assert itself more. And you see that with countries like Turkey, as well as major countries like Russia and China. So I think that, again, the issue with North Korea is that if there's a vacuum there, then China might step forward more aggressively to fill that vacuum. Uh, similarly, that occurs, that could occur in the Taiwan Strait in the South China Sea. That could occur with Russia uh, in Eastern Europe or the Mediterranean. Uh, but I think the big risk today is really emanating from this U.S.-China uh, bad relations and the fact that Trump has an election looming overhead. Let's switch gears now to talk about the uh, larger macro picture around the world. The uh, pandemic we're seeing now has triggered another recession. Some are saying it's uh, potentially even more severe than the last one. What do you think the ramifications are for geopolitics around the world? That's the big thing. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, geopolitics will be the next shoe to drop. We've all watched the pandemic and then we've watched the economic fallout. Now we get the political recriminations. And I think that much of this discussion has centered on China rightly because it's China truly that has been a driver for global growth, uh, that has had a pretty much uh, rock solid economy uh, over the over the past 40 years. And then over the past 10 years, it's been having more problems shifting to domestic led growth. And this is a pandemic that has harmed domestic growth and, and uh, animal spirits among the households. So that's a big risk to China, which means it's a risk to the region. China could be more assertive, more nationalistic. Uh, also, you could have uh, those countries uh, just simply not exporting as much to China. And then meanwhile, okay. the oil the oil countries, too, I think would I'd put very high on that list. Russia and Iran, uh, the OPEC states, those are the uh, ones that because of this huge oil overhang 
in supply are really suffering and therefore you can have political blowback. Do you think governments are reacting adequately to the virus breakout around the world? Do you think policy responses are helping the economy or making it worse? Well, generally to lift aggregate demand, the policy has been extraordinarily stimulative, both fiscal and monetary. And that's probably a good thing to not allow a deeper hold and output to emerge. So that's positive. But obviously, countries have been very different in terms of how prepared they were for the pandemic. South Korea, Japan, Singapore, countries that are used to pandemics from China did a great job. They were prepared. Germany was prepared. But a a number of other countries, specifically southern Europe and the U.S., were not well prepared. So they'll have blowback as well. And therefore, even though the stimulus, especially in the U.S., is very big, that's an important element you will still have a lot of fallout from this event that will create uncertainty for policy, specifically because of the election. I think what a lot of investors are wondering now is whether or not the government, especially in the U.S., is doing enough right now to alleviate the pain of um, the economic fallout. We've seen uh, stimulus checks being handed out, but is that enough? It depends on how long the lockdowns drag on and how long uh, the, uh, you know, whether when we start to marginally open the economy in different states, whether then you get big outbreaks that swamp the hospitals. I mean, the bottom line is if you get a big outbreak that swamps a local hospital and in a major city, uh, then, of course, you start to have higher death rates than the virus would otherwise produce because you have a lack of care. And you can wear out your doctors and nurses. So if there were a resumption or I should say a a, a second wave developing because of reopening, then that could require certain regions to lock down again and then you'd need more stimulus. But as far as we've seen, uh, first of all, countries are getting over the hump in terms of the flattening the curve and getting used to this. We're learning more. The virus is mostly affects certain demographics that can be cloistered off from the rest of society. The overall death rate is not as extreme as once believed. And uh, and then we've had unprecedented stimulus. So I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but obviously, in the near term, you can have a lot of confusion. And in, in the U.S., I think that's very clear between the, the federal government and the states. On that note, let's touch on the elections in uh, November here. Uh, well, first of all, there are some rumors going around that the election day may be postponed. Um, is that true? No, I I would dismiss those rumors. That requires the House of Representatives to change laws that have been in place for a long time. Uh, One updated in 1948, they would have to change, and others going back to the 1850s. Uh, House is controlled by Democrats. Why would they want to change the election date for President Trump? And President Trump would look weak if he tried to postpone the election. That's a sign of uncertainty, as if he's not confident that he can win. So it's a bad idea. But the other key thing to remember there is that the U.S. Constitution requires a four-year term for the president. So even if you did change the law, uh, you would only be able to delay it for a little while because at the end of the year, you're at the end of the four-year term constitutionally. And you need two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-fourths of the states to ratify a constitutional change. Where do you see Trump's uh, chances of re-election uh, weighing right now? Uh, economists have called the virus a black swan event. Has that changed the pendulum at all? Yeah, definitely. The uh, President Trump was lined up to win the election. Uh, the best predictors of a U.S. election, which is a regular event every four years, so we've got good data on it going back over 100, uh, 100 years of, st- of you know very regular data. Um, it shows that elections that are held during recessions are usually very negative for the incumbent. Trump would be trying to win uh, and do something that has not been done since 1904, which is, despite a recession, win re-election. So that's an important point. The reason for that is unemployment goes up, unemployed people are angry, and they have time to go vote. So there's a big turnout impact from unemployment. Uh, That's very negative for Trump, and that has to do with the overall material conditions of the country. It really doesn't have anything to do with the narrative surrounding that. Now, uh-huh. there are exceptions, being that the stimulus is so gigantic, you could see start to the economy start to improve by November. Uh, it is true that former Vice President Joe Biden has weaknesses as a candidate that are pretty well known. Um, and it's also true that the virus was not initially President Trump's fault. So uh, it'll be important to see if his approval rating continues to remain pretty firm in the wake of the crisis. But uh, generally speaking, you would expect unemployment goes up, the president's approval goes down, and he's much less Mm -hmm. likely to win re-election. Last time uh, Trump won 
partly due to the rising global trend of populism. Could you not argue that he could leverage this opportunity to further his nationalistic cause and rally even more votes? Yeah, I think his case is that he was all about closing borders, reducing globalization and taking on China. And uh, COVID has caused us to close borders. Uh, it has heightened focus on the fact that our medical supply chain is overly dependent on China. Uh, and in general, China has um, you know, launched a disinformation campaign to distract from its own problems. And Trump is trying to scapegoat China to distract from his problems. So I think we will have very bad China relations, like I said earlier, but um, also you're right that that could potentially play into his favor. I think the point, though, uh, against that is simply that uh, populism or no populism, the question of a U.S. election is whether a voter is better off than they were four years ago. And when unemployment is, say, around 20 percent, uh, it's just going to be hard to see in the swing states that 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 a president who barely won a, on a thin margin in those swing states is going to prevail again. OK, so he so he can do it. He can definitely do it. But it's uh, but it's not shouldn't be your base case. So it's uh, the base case is uh, um, reduced chances of Trump being Biden at this point. Yeah, I, well, I'd say base case is Biden wins. Uh, simply because people look around in October and there's people and, and they don't have a job. Mm, understood. OK, so I know that uh, you've uh, put out a long position for gold um, earlier in the year, and that's obviously done well. What is your investment thesis, given the heightened geopolitical uh, risk premiums that you're applying now? Uh, I mean, look, the, the, the key thing for gold is populism, as you mentioned, which is really underlying the, the Democrats as well, that populism won't go away. If Biden can win, then he's going to have to deliver more protectionism and uh, and more spending for his constituents, including in the Rust Belt. Um, and that's actually happening in other areas as well. So you've got global populism. You also have global great power struggle or great power competition between the U.S. and China, U.S. and Russia. Uh, China and Russia are buying a lot of gold. Uh, you have global uncertainty as a result of that. So I think the question is the dollar. If the dollar is extraordinarily spiking as it has been this year, uh, it can take some of the air out, out of gold uh, because it ultimately is a deflationary context uh, uh -huh. in that case. But we've seen the Fed act to provide global liquidity. We've seen uh, all this massive stimulus. As long as the economic rebound occurs globally, and that, in and that includes China's massive stimulus, then you have a an ability for uh, gold to benefit from an a reflationary uh, impulse as well as from the fact that there are all these political risks. Great, excellent thoughts today, Matt. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for being here and letting me pick your brain. And I uh, hope yeah, you're staying you. safe. Absolutely, you too. Appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you for watching. We'll have a lot more for you, so stay tuned.